So welcome. My name is Kara Wilmot. I'm with Art Resource Materials and Technology Center for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, RMTC DHH. And I'm joined today by Dr. Caroline Gardino. She is an Associate Professor and the Director of the Deaf Education Program at the University of North Florida. And today she will be presenting Deafness and Diversity. I do want you to know a little bit about this Zoom environment before we begin. Note that today's webinar is being closed captioned. To see the closed captions, click the caption button in the Zoom menu and the captions will appear along the bottom of your screen. Thank you to Brooke Nunn, the captioner today for her service. We wanna make sure that everyone can contribute to the conversation, even though your microphone is muted. We wanna hear your questions, comments, and thoughts and interact with each other in the room. If you don't see the chat panel, click the chat button in the Zoom menu and you can select specific attendees to chat with during the webinar, or you can click all so that everyone will see what's being said. Um, Above the field where you enter your text, you'll see a blue drop down menu and you should be able to select everyone if you want to communicate with everyone. So to select all panelists from the menu. I will be monitoring the chat and dropping links into the resources through this, throughout this webinar. As a reminder, we do request that you take a post survey for TA Live. It is helpful for all of us to be able to collect the data because data is our friend and very friendly to our continued funding. So getting the data from you is important to us. We thank you in advance for contributing to our continued self-assessment of our work. But now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gardino. Okay, great. Now, is, can you hear me clearly? Do we need to do any microphone checks to make sure that the participants can hear me all right? So if you guys just want to type in the box, if you cannot hear anything, um, let us know. But um, looks like right. we're ready. Excellent. Thank you for having me here today. I'm very eager to share with you information about how we can work together to support professionals like yourselves and families with children who are deaf with disabilities. Uh, in general, we use the term deafness and diversity, and I'll dive into that a little bit later because really the focus today is on students who are deaf with disabilities. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I began teaching, wow, um, about um, over 20 years ago. Let's just generalize so I don't make myself sound too old. But um, I realized quickly when I started working in self-contained classrooms, both in general ed settings as well as at residential schools, that my preparation to teach students who are deaf with disabilities was missing. It was very minimal. Although my master's degree is in special education, my courses specific to deafness really didn't overlap in terms of providing me information on students who are deaf with disabilities. So I either got it isolated in special education, talking about students with autism, learning disabilities, behavior disorders, and then I had classes specific on students who are deaf. And typically those courses were talking about um, students who are deaf, but not inclusive of those with disabilities. And so we constantly had to match that content. And it's actually not very different from today. And you'll realize that when I share with you information about a survey that I completed 10 years ago, and we'll compare it with your answers if you're able to participate using Poll Everywhere. So if you see this picture, you can see that my, the students in my class were very diverse. I had approximately 11 students, and of those 11 students, I had one student with a learning disability, had one student with Asperger syndrome, one student with autism, and I had two students with behavior disorders. And, um, and obviously, there are some, were some students where their, di their disability wasn't diagnosed. And so that became very overwhelming because I figured, you know, as the teacher, I wanted to make sure to get these students the best possible education, provide them the best possible education. But it was difficult because I didn't have sufficient information about their disabilities in order to feel confident when serving them in the classroom. That's what really urged me to go back to my graduate program and to pursue a doctorate so that I could pursue this passion and better understand how we can serve students who are deaf with disabilities. I also delve into research in reading, 
using alternative methods such as graphic novels. And I like to analyze classroom environments and other learning environments to determine what ways that we can increase academic engagement and decrease disruptive behaviors. And so I'll share with you a couple slides from that research because we know that that it pertains specifically to students who are deaf with disabilities, but then it also helps all students in the classroom. And I suppose when you have questions, you'll ask those and um, Kara will do a polite job of interrupting me. All right. So um, as I stated, I would like to use Poll Everywhere to allow you to contribute to this presentation. Your contribution is completely volunteer. You do not have to contribute. You can contribute to some of the questions and, and others not. It's anonymous. There's no way for me to track the information from this poll to you. So that might help you feel more confident when you're responding. And um, the idea is that if I, when I present, I want to not only know about you, but I want you all to know about each other because we often hold a lot of information that is not clearly available unless we have the opportunity to share it with one another. So when you use Poll Everywhere, it's sort of like a text message or tweeting. You, it's very short message, whatever you put in that uh, message bar will then, and press send, will show up on my screen. So it is true. You could sabotage this presentation and Sherry Conrad has joking, joked with me before that, you know, if you put up a, a text message that doesn't pertain to the topic, yes, we will see that as well. So um, please don't sabotage my presentation. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. So let's get started. Just to get to know you a little bit better, what grade levels are, of students are you serving? I know so the itinerant teachers are probably K through 12, serving the whole gamut. And then I knew that there was a director, adults, okay. We just had a, oh great, oh second grade. Mm -hmm. We just had a intern complete her internship in a classroom with adult learners and that was pretty exciting. And, she was very pleased to see her progress. Excellent. Okay, so. So if you um, missed it, there was, it's a poll everywhere. You can actually put the poll.ev.com backslash C Gardino942, and then you can enter your responses or you can text your responses. Or if you're putting it in the chat box, I'm adding what you're putting in the chat box. Oh, thank you, Kara. That's great. That'll increase the participation. I appreciate that. And approximately how many years experience do you have teaching with students who are deaf or hard of hearing? Got some veterans. I see 20, 20 plus years. Ooh, 39. Wow, Suzanne. Four to 10. That's great. It's, it looks like we have some veteran teachers here. Um, and so I'm sure that you'll have quite a bit to contribute to the poll when we discuss different strategies and resources that are available when working with students who are deaf with disabilities. Great. 30 plus years from Pam, seven from Silvana, 15 from Paulson. Great. All right. So remember these numbers too, um, because I'm, like I said, I'm going to compare you to a survey that was completed approximately 10 years ago. So that'll give you an idea of where you stand based on the rest of um, teacher, teach other teachers in the nation. So when working with students who are deaf with disabilities, what are your greatest needs? Language, so communication, Human resources, yep, the, the power to collaborate, parent support. Behavioral difficulties. Behavioral challenges. Every one of these need 
is completely understandable and legitimate considering how difficult it is for us to find the time to be able to work together, to reach out to our parents, to be able to utilize different strategies in order to increase a student's ability to communicate and to build their language repertoire. And behaviors, obviously, if we uh, are having a difficult time managing behaviors, then we can't get to teaching. So that's, that's incredibly important as well. I appreciate all of the participation. I really do. This is excellent. The more that we share, the more that we can learn together. So understanding how disabilities impact teaching along with deafness, mm -hmm. developing materials for students with sub second grade level and limited cognitive resources. Excellent. Well, let's see if we can answer some of these needs or at least point you in a direction where you'll feel more confident when you are working with your students who are deaf with disabilities, appropriate materials. And I hear that a lot, not only for students who are deaf with disabilities, but also for students who are deaf and multilingual learners. And I'll delve into that a bit. Those are students who come from homes where their parents don't, do, not use, do not speak English or they do not use American Sign Language. Assessment materials, yes, another huge need. Mm -hmm. Understanding what materials to use, when and how often to use them, what's appropriate accommodations when we are using assessments. Great. I'm going to advance to the next slide just for the sake of time, but I will have all of these results. And if um, at some point you'd like to reach out to me for me to share these, oh, I guess it'll be video recorded, so you'll be all right appropriate setting with qualified staff. And that's a challenge as well, because we know that there's a huge teacher shortage, not only in Florida, but throughout the United States. And with that teacher shortage, it means it's that, it's that much more difficult to find qualified personnel to serve not only students who are deaf in general, but students who are deaf with disabilities. Great, thank you. All right, so this is the slide where I, you can call it a confession, you can call it an admission, you can call it a self-disclosure, but really, Sometimes student, sometimes uh, professionals think, oh, you have all the answers or, you know, you know exactly what to do. Well, the truth is they're really, I really don't. I don't have those answers, but I do have information that I can share. I do have resources and, um, and also strategies that I can can advise you, but really there are so many professionals that are doing amazing work right now with students who are deaf with disabilities. And we, I encourage a platform in which we can share those ideas because together we contain the, the, the knowledge and the power. And by sharing that information, we are far better off than trying to figure out how to do this alone, how to work with these students alone. And unfortunately, there is not a lot of research on students who are deaf with disabilities. And in some cases, you'll see that there, there was none, there's a rise and there's a fall. And I'll show you a, a table that illustrates the amount of research that we have and why that alone is not sufficient in order to inform us of how to teach when working with students who are deaf with disabilities. So today, because we have an hour, that's really a drop in the bucket. But if you look at this picture, you can see a drop in the bucket creates a ripple effect. And so even though today is just one hour of information, that information can be spread and shared. And that's what I'm saying in terms of collaborating and sharing. And, and when you, like the, for your participation in the poll, you can see that we will, there's so much more information that is generated and shared amongst each other. It's really helpful. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to talk to you about the terminology we use when referring to students who are deaf with disabilities. I want to give you some statistics, the demographic information about this population, talk to you about teachers preparedness and what we can do to reach out and find additional strategies and resources for you to use now and in the future. Things that I am not going to talk about today because of time limitations, is that the identification process, the assessment process, and placement. And I've heard from many, many teachers um, about the challenges with these three areas. So instead of trying to bite off more than we can chew today, 
let's focus on what is the best possible way to begin this conversation. And that is with providing you some with some strategies and resources. I'm going to pause to allow you some time to look at the slide before I speak. So typically when I think it varies, we professionals will use terms such as deaf plus or multiply disabled deaf or deaf with additional disabilities. And so what I really want to challenge you all today to do is to ask yourself, what is the main challenge for that child? Is it because they're deaf that they are having difficulty learning, developing, hitting milestones, growing socially, emotionally, academically, behaviorally? Or is it because they have a disability and that is the challenge? Because if you answer that it's because they have a disability, then we need to make that the primary term that we use when speaking about this population. So instead of saying deaf plus, because if we say deaf plus, we're saying that a student is deaf and that's, that's problematic, plus they've got all these other challenges. But if we say, or if they're deaf with additional disabilities, then we're emphasizing, we're still emphasizing deafness. But if we were to say a student is deaf with autism, then that leaves the person receiving that message thinking autism, that child has autism, or the student, or, or does the student have autism and is deaf? Because if you were to, to use that phrase, then what, the, what does that leave you thinking? Okay, well, the child, student has autism and is deaf. Either way, we want to focus on the disability which is not the primary, that is the primary concern. We don't wanna focus on deafness as being the, dis, the disabling challenge for this child. And so what the term that we are promoting is to use deaf with a disability or deaf with disabilities. And by doing so, we are not focusing on the deafness. We are focusing on the disability that is the primary concern for educating our students who are deaf with disabilities. And then those disabilities, there's a huge range of disabilities. And so um, we talk about learning disabilities, autism, attention deficit, emotional behavior disorders, syndromes, we talk about syndromes as well. And that's the primary condition that's impacting their educational, social, emotional, and or behavioral development. Any questions about the terminology we use with students who are deaf with disabilities? All right, then let's look at the demographic information. Can you, Kara, are they able to see my cursor when uh, I am on this main slide? Yes, they can okay. see your cursor. Okay, perfect. Because this Venn diagram can be a little complicated, so I want to explain it to you. So if we look at the statistics, from the Gallaudet Research Institute. The last year that they collected data was in 2012 and it's, it, it's analyzed and reported in 2013. So they, the Gallaudet Research Institute is reporting that there are roughly 23,700 deaf and hard hearing students in the United States. But if you look at the National Center on the Educational Statistics, you can see that there are 78,000. So they are able to capture many more students who are deaf and hard of hearing than the GRI data. Well, why is that? Typically, it's because the GRI data is limited by trying to have teachers respond to their annual survey, which is not as easy as the national database, which utilizes information at the federal level. So the different, the number of IEPs and the students who are identified as being deaf or hard of hearing. Whereas GRI is relying on teachers to provide finite information about each of their students 
and report that in detail back to them. So you can see that discrepancy, but you can also see that if we look under the uh, students served under IDEA, there are approximately six and a half million students. And of those six and a half million students, if you compare what this overlap, that 40%, so the, this 40% are students who are both deaf and have a disability. Deaf and have a disability, approximately 40%. And that statistic has held true since they've been collecting this data in, since the 1990s. So then if we look a little further, the reason uh, I remember Kara introduced me and talked about deafness and diversity, well, the diversity piece is our English language learners. So if you look at the data here, that over, this overlaps 35%, the Gaeta Research Institute is reporting that 35% of our students are deaf and English language learners. They come from a home where their parents do not speak English or use ASL. And then if you look even further into our students who are deaf and diverse, this is that 11%. So 11% of the students are, have a disability, are multilingual. They come from a home where their parents don't speak English or use ASL and they're deaf. 11%, that is not a small number. That is something for us to be very in tune with because that is not a population that is being addressed at this point. But over time, we're slowly going to um, we are slowly working on changing that the, the dissemination of information that is available on students who are deaf with disabilities and multilingual. Here you have the GRI demographics, the Gallaudet Re Research Institute. And if you look, you can see that intellectual disability is one of the highest prevalence rates among students who are deaf then to learning disabilities all the way down to emotional disturbance. What makes it challenging, I already shared with you the fact that teachers have to report this data and teachers are busy, so may not, they may not have the same amount of time to complete that the survey as would somebody who, um, perhaps a parent or perhaps an administrator, but then an administrator may not know the student as well, so that's also a challenge. It's difficult to get the survey to teachers and to, to students in rural areas. It also is difficult to get the survey to general ed teachers because they are not the immediate contact for many of our students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Also, terminology can be confusing. So when teachers or professionals are filling out this survey, sometimes like the discrepancy between legally blind and low vision isn't very clear and so they may not always mark exactly the appropriate response or the student has more than one disability so they mark several categories and then that percentage will the the population will exceed 100 percent which is not as big as a problem as our as teachers who or professionals who don't complete certain items and so only 88 percent of the professionals who filled out the GRI survey data this year, completed the information on students who are deaf with disabilities. And so we know that this has limitations, but it is a good representation of the 23,000 students that were surveyed in 2013. And these is what, this as well has not changed much through time. You can still see that we, we have about a 40%, 40, 42% uh, incident rate incidence rate of students who are deaf with disabilities. So here's the survey. I administered the survey over a decade ago and the goal was to determine teachers preparedness to work with students who are deaf with disabilities. Also to ascertain where are they getting this information? Um, what kind of resources are they using? What kind of strategies? And so if you look at the participants, there were 264 who completed the survey and 92% were females, 78% had a master's degree or higher, 8% males, and these are their current teaching settings. So the majority of those teachers were in residential schools, but we also had some teachers in self-contained classrooms, as well as the itinerants and resource teachers. 
The participants were represented from 25 states across the United States, which is fairly good representation of how teachers across the nation are responding and working with students who are deaf with disabilities. So let me ask you, how, what, approximately what percent of your students have a diagnosed disability? So you would text A if it's none, text B if 10 to, I know you have to do a little bit of math, the last time I, I administered this poll, I did not offer 100%, and several of the teachers came up to me and said, 100% of my kids have a disability. And I was like, wow, okay, I gotta add that. So, so really what you're showing me now, the rate at which you serve students who are deaf with disabilities is on par with the GRI data. And in some cases is exceeding the GRI data when you say 50 to 75 percent. Now I'm going to take it one step further. Okay, let me do one thing. I should take a screenshot of that so I can compare your answers. All right, so let's let's find out approximately what percent of your students do you perceive having a disability because often it's our perception and it's difficult to get that diagnosis. But teachers are with our students most of the day and so we tend to know them very well and we can discern if we think that a child is having an issue beyond deafness. 100% wow. So if I, when I compare this data, what a diagnosed disability versus, versus a perceived disability, the difference is anywhere from, I'd say 20 to, you bet, yeah, about 20%, 20 to, yeah, about 20 to 20, 20 to 30% is your reporting that you're per, you perceive, oh, well now we're up to 70. Okay, so remember you when you reported the number or the percent of students who are diagnosed with a disability, that was about 40%. So, but your perception is 70%, approximately 70. So it's 30% greater. And I Carol, believe you are right. Yes? We have a comment from Corey. She said because of their minimal language and many of many of her students many of them could or have a language impairment in addition to their deafness, which I think was also discussed at BIDA, was that language impairment, quite a few, and there was some discussion as to whether that is truly an additional disability. Yeah, I do you remember that topic coming up? And, uh, and I, I believe that I responded, if you perceive them as having a, a, a disability, that's what I want to know. Look, because your perception is important because that perception is what's going to start and in the investigation, the assessments, the, the, the conversation of what more can we do for this, this child. Okay, so your, so again, back to your, your perception versus the diagnosis is there's about a 30% increase in what you think your student, the, the number of students have um, a disability. Let's look at how the 264 teachers responded. GRI data is the dark column. The respondents, the 264 teachers, responded is the light gray. So let's look at these differences. This perception right here, that, that, that's not as, as great as some of the individual disabilities. So here, let's look at their lear learning disability. The GRI reports that about 7% of the population have a learning disability. The deaf and hard of hearing population have a learning disability. You know what teachers believe? about 20% more of their students have a learning disability than one is reported on the survey. Here, attention deficit, about 15% greater. So you can see that these numbers, here's 10% and 7%. And so teachers on, on a whole, teachers believe their students 
have a disability that hasn't been diagnosed, but is impacting their develop their academic, social, emotional, and behavioral development. And that's important. We want to make sure to to listen to how you are feeling, what you are seeing with your students, and what we can do in order to improve those services. So then I asked teachers a, a myriad of questions, but I'm just going to pull out one, and that is, do they feel prepared to meet the educational needs of students who are deaf with disabilities? And if you look at the response, well, only half of them feel that most of the time they're prepared. And then you look at this sometimes and seldom, and if you add those numbers up, that's 40%. 40% of teachers believe that they're not adequately prepared to serve the students who are deaf with disabilities. That's that, and, and it's not any person's fault. It's just a matter of making sure that we do a better job to prepare pre-service teachers and to provide current practitioners with the resources that they need. And that's part of what we're gonna do today. Where do you go to find answers when you have a question about a student who's deaf with disability or even not even a student per se, but the disability in general? Question about autism or a uh, question about a learning disability. Where do you go to find those answers? Coworkers, you uh, in at the districts, you go to RMTC, great resource. You, you, you reach out to other itinerants. You, you reach out to professional organizations. Well, this is great. And that's not very far from what the 264 respondents did as well. So they said it was very helpful to attend conferences. To, and those conferences, I remember when I was in Hawaii and I had a student who was deaf with autism and I attended a conference on autism and it was very eye opening. And so I would suggest that as if possible, if your district allows for professional development, uh, target a conference where you know that the, the main topic is on the disability in which you're seeking information. It might even be a special education conference, in which case you're going to have information across all disability categories in-service trainings, personal research by um, reaching out, finding literature via the library, the internet, pamphlets, doctors from doctor's offices, this, like, like you all said, seeking help from colleagues and other professionals, and then trial, trial and error, piggybacked with years of experience. And so I'm thinking that some of the veteran teachers in this in the audience today are probably nodding their heads because yes, the trial and error, but I don't want you to have to rely on trial and error. I'd rather you have a set of tools where you can use them and discover which one is best. And so that's what we're working towards. I'm gonna allow you a moment to read. So what this slide is saying is basically we teachers can use best practices and we can use reason based research because of the things that we're doing in our classroom. But until we have evidence based research and we actually conduct interventions with students who are deaf with disabilities, we will not know with 100% certainty what is the best strategies to use. So my colleague and I, Dr. Joanna Cannon, decided to, we were asked by the editor, Peter Paul, of the American Annals of the Deaf, which is the oldest and most pristine, well, I mean, you could argue, it is the oldest uh, journal in the field of deaf education, is definitely a top journal in our field. Uh, Peter Paul came and asked myself to do a special issue and I reached out to my colleague, Dr. Joanna Cannon, who focuses on students who are deaf, multilingual learners. And the two of us reached out to other professionals and other researchers in the field, and we asked them to, based on their areas of ex expertise, to come together and help us write a special issue to provide the field with information 
about the moment a child is born and they're deaf to the moment that they transition into adulthood. And the special issue one focuses all on students who are deaf with disabilities. And then the special issue two, uh, the spring 2016, focus on students who are deaf multilingual learners. So there's two special issues and that was the first part of our journey in order to disseminate information that's available. And the second part is two textbooks. The first, um, the textbook is at this point entitled Deafness and Diversity. There's a volume one all on students who are deaf with disabilities. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today are some select strategies from those chapters and some select resources from those chapters. The book will be published in the spring 2019 and I will delve into a little bit more of how you can get more information about those um, that those textbooks and so the the textbook on students who are deaf multilingual will be published in 2020. The one last thing I wanted to say about the special journal issues that you can reach out to me through ResearchGate if you Google my name and ResearchGate and I may be able to give you a copy of one or two of the articles from the issue. If you have access to a university library, that is another route that you can take in order to, to obtain those articles. So I already talked to you about the term. This is the introduction article from the special issue. And we really talk about the terminology and the demographical data. Then we talk about the theoretical framework and prevalence of the existing research, as well as strategies and resource, resources. So what I'm going to do, we've already talked about the terminology and the demographic data. I'm going to talk to you about these last three items. This was a, quite a challenge. So Dr. Paul asked me to delve into what type of theoretical framework would we apply when, you, when working with students who are deaf with disabilities. And that took quite some time. I actually, if you read the introduction article, you'll see that I scour the entire repertoire of publications available from around the world to apply one theoretical framework that I think would be sufficient in really addressing our students who are deaf with disabilities. And the one that I found that I felt was most applicable was the socio-cultural theory. And Easterbrooks and Baker in their linguistics book published in 2002 discussed those principles. And I wanna share those with you and how they apply to students who are DWD, deaf with disabilities. So we wanna provide our students with the most natural interactions possible within their own native culture. And this is paramount for children so that they can build an understanding of their social and behavioral norms, doing this in a natural, not scripted environment. We also want adults and peers influence to influence of their cognitive development and learning. So we want not only students to be able to learn from the adults and peers around them, but we want them to be able to grow in terms of their cultural beliefs and practices within those environments. And researchers cannot study the, the child alone. In order to better understand students who are deaf with disabilities, we need to look at them in relationship to their other surroundings. So how do they interact and behave with different people, objects in different settings, such as the home, school, park, church, etc. Getting a very uh, multiple perspective of, our of, the, of the student or the child. We wanna provide them with multiple opportunities to develop their knowledge and skills and we can support that with, by working with various adults and various peers. So eventually the child can perform tasks independently, such as um, promoted by Vygotsky um, in his zone of proximal development. It's that same idea, multiple opportunities, scaffolding, allow that child to learn, to develop, to work, then eventually independently. We want to um, look at events, activities that happen in context so that their learning is contextualized so that the student can build a repertoire of background knowledge and we know how important that background knowledge is for our students who are deaf and it's even much more important for our students who are deaf with disabilities so providing them the social and ac academic opportunities to be successful to develop to learn 
in context, not isolated. And last, the, the, the last principle of the sociocultural theory is that social, behavioral, and academic development are continually growing and transforming. And so that will happen as long as we provide multiple opportunities and we allow that individual to be influenced by their social and cultural experiences. And so that maybe that, you know, is a little bit abstract or vague. So I'm going to give it to you in the very simplistic teacher or professional terminology. You know what we want to do? We want to look at the child as a whole. We want to look at what they can do. What is their, we want to use asset-based instruction. So they're good at this. How can we build that skill? Let's continue to build on what the child is able to do rather than noting all the things that they can't do because they can if given the opportunities. And I said I was going to talk to you about the prevalence and frequency of existing research. So here, give you a second to look at this. Looks like colorful candy canes. I definitely am in the spirit with my Santa hat. Okay. So if you look at learning disabilities, in prior to 1990, each decade there was about, it started to grow. There was some recognition that students who are deaf with learning disabilities, it, we, need, we need more information. We want to learn more about them. And so the 1990 to 1999, look, there are 10 publications about students who are deaf with disabilities, but then what happened? Uh, deaf with learning disabilities. What happens? After Y2K, it just dropped off completely. I think there's one, I think I might have found one article. It's actually a book chapter um, in doing our research for the textbook. I found, I located one article here, but still there's a, a, a rise and then a drastic fall and that's not okay. We need to be studying these, remember learning disabilities, one of the higher um, incidence rates as well in terms of deafness with a disability. Intellectual disabilities, very little research. Attention deficit, boom, of a spike right there for, te for a decade, 2000, 2009, then drop again. Sometimes I think that you see these spikes because researchers get grants to study and then when the grant isn't funded again, and there's a possibility that the publications drop off. And then uh, e emotional behavior disorder is very sporadic. At least it's being more uh, frequently addressed in the last decade. And then we see autism, a huge increase in autism, which is excellent. Um, but I'd love to see all of these numbers rise, as would you, I'm sure. For the sake of time, I've only chosen three disability areas that I want to dive into in terms of providing you with some strategies and resources. But in the textbook, we address all of these as well as syndromes. Um, actually, gifted and talented, we sought, we tried so hard to find an author, somebody who specialized in students who are deaf and gifted and talented, and we we exhausted all of our resources and we're talking about worldwide. We've reached out to uh, researchers in Australia and Europe and nobody was willing or able to write this chapter. And so if any of you are interested in pursuing a master's degree and want to write a, a sec second master's degree and want to write a thesis or want a PhD, this is a, an area that's completely open to you, to you and would be worthwhile because we know some of our students are, de are deaf and gifted and talented. So here's our fact. We're going to start off with a fact and then a research-based strategies and some resources and then there's going to be an opportunity for you to provide your input. I think that fact was reviewed. I just I mentioned that as well when we talked about the GRI data. So intellectual disability these strategies by Pamela Luft we want to uh, provide opportunities for students who are deaf with intellectual disabilities to use speech generated devices so that they can improve their behavior as well as their communication. We want to be careful when using those devices of the acoustical environment in which we're using them to make sure that respondents can 
hear easily, can access that information, and that would be for the teachers that Obviously, we're not going to use speech generating devices if a student is in a self-contained signing environment because that would not be as a, um, a, a, a it would not be appropriate. We want to make sure that we're looking at an environment where they're going to get some response if using speech generated devices. We want to look at communication partners, provide opportunities for students to learn in very uh, comfortable um, scenarios where we practice communication, turn-taking, pacing, pausing. We also, and that's true for students who use listening spoken language or those who are, or students who are signers. We also want to use scripts to walk students through different types of routines and plan dialogue. So if we know that they're going for a job interview or we know that they're going to have to talk to their teacher about um, their homework assignment or uh, something uh, that's troubling them between them and a peer, you know, often providing opportunities, scripting what that looks like, how, it, how to review that information is very helpful with our students who are deaf with intellectual disabilities. I'm not going to delve into any of these resources. I'm not going to click on them and open them because that's something that you can do now that you have the, the PDF, but these are some of the recommended resources that that Dr. Luft would refer professionals to in terms of um, working with students who are deaf with intellectual disabilities. Let's see, uh, do you have any strategies or resources that you'd like to share? And then I'm going to share with you what the Florida Educators of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing members respond, how they responded to give you an idea. Great. Yeah, the Claire Center, the Claire Center has great information and guide that um, often they recently changed their website. So it's nice of you to offer that link. Well, just for the sake of time, I'm going to advance and show you. I saw another one come up. Picture exchange. Great. And that's what you'll see over here as well is that the to members. This is last month in November, the first week of November. They talked about different strategies that they use uh, with their students who are deaf with intellectual disabilities. And we've got graphic organizers. I don't, I know I thought PEX was up here. Or maybe the board, they've got board maker and social stories and modeling and repetition. These are all very viable and helpful strategies that we can use visual scaffold, scaffolds for assignments. And you're gonna to start to see some of these strategies overlap with some of the different disability areas. Let's look at autism spectrum disorder. Zymansky, Bryce, Lamb, and Hodo in 2012 estimated that one in every 59 deaf and hard of hearing students also exhibits autism spectrum disorder. That is incredibly high and incredibly important for us to remember. And it, the most challenging part is, and that number could actually be greater because it's very difficult to, di to identify and diagnose students who are deaf as having ASD because we already know that there are some challenges with communication and language development and socialization. And so really uh, picking apart what is it that is typical deafness versus deafness and autism can be a challenge, but we need to remember, okay, well, we know that there are a lot of students who are deaf with autism, and so what different strategies can we use when working with these children? Definitely ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, that will help with communication and behavioral issues. We've got a functional behavior analysis to determine what is causing the challenges with behavior or communication. Here we have PECS that was mentioned earlier for students with intellectual disabilities as well as autism. This is interesting. There was a study where the researchers found that students who are deaf with autism often do reverse palm orientation. So that's something that's really important to know. And if you recognize it, 
they're saying that you there are multiple strategies that you can use by sitting by the side the child instead of across from the child to teach them explicitly and directly what are the facial cues of signers because that can be confusing a lot of sign language is produced the message is also pre produced on the face so what do the what do those facial expressions mean as paired with sign language and also separated from sign language how do you read how a person is feeling and then again using speech generated uh, devices i want to point out these researchers bruce and borders as well as borders bach and probes they are doing prolific work right now in um, Illinois with students, with children who are deaf with autism. So if you Google their names, you will probably, they told me that there are some online training um, videos that you can see on YouTube. So go ahead and explore that as well as these links that they've provided. And then any other uh, autism spectrum disorder strategies that you'd like to share with the group? For the sake of time, okay, that was, it looks like we're having an answer come in. Um, I could share with you the, the feed it numbers. iPads, board maker social stories, sensory toys, tactile schedule board, Handcrafted Education ASL by Angie Craft. Augmented Communication Devices. And ADHD. This will be the last disability area that we have time to, to review today. So you can see that the the Incidence rate or the prevalence rate of students who have ADHD and are deaf is anywhere is two to three times higher than in the general population. And this is consistent with some of the other disability areas as well. And so if we look at these strategies, we we want to provide auditory visual breaks. This left, this right hand column of the table will tell you specific to student, specific strategies for students who are ADHD and, and, and deaf. And then this is for the general population. And so what we do often as researchers is we extrapolate from the general field of special education or the general field of ELL, English language learners, and we apply that information to students who are deaf with disabilities without actually conducting a huge amount of research, intervention research, and the biggest challenge is that all of these students are spread out. They're very spread out uh, around the nation. So conducting research with students who are deaf with disabilities is a very huge challenge, given that we don't have a concentration of the students in order to implement a strategy in a classroom of all students who are deaf with autism, or a class. Is, and I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the best model I, anyway, but we do need to find better means to investigate and conduct systematic research with students who are deaf with disabilities. So ADHD develop self-awareness, and I'd say the self-awareness self-regulation uh, tools should always be visual, and in some cases tactile, but I would be careful with tactile, especially with students who are ADHD, they have difficult time not uh, being distracted by tactile materials. And then teaching them organizational skills uh, it's going to take time, but it will definitely advance them as they feel they're more safe and organized with their content. Here are some resources. And then let me go into other ADHD strategies shared by the FEDA members. Or the FETI. I'm not sure. It's, I didn't learn to read phonetically. Okay, so planners, go noodle, metronomes. That's interesting knee moves, and some of these things I would have to ask the, the audience members, um, and, and then they would expand. But the fidget spinner, you know, providing rewards that allow them to get out some of that um, 
hyperactivity, but then go back and, and focus on their schoolwork and, and their academics or their behavioral routine. These are a couple of strategies that I learned through my classroom environment research that I'm going to share with you. And that is pr by providing a high contrast surface. And um, at the School for the Deaf and Blind, they used black contact paper. It allows for students who are ADHD or have EBD, emotional behavior disorders, it allows that content to really uh, stand out from the rest. Instead of that wood surface or the faux wood surface really doesn't, doesn't, isn't high contrast with the white paper or other handouts, but the black surface then is high contrast. And it's very useful for students with ADHD, EBD, and um, visual impairment because it allows them to see that high contrast, have less distraction and more focus. And then we use individual workspace. So providing, by providing these classroom carols, which are very inexpensive. In some classrooms, teachers allowed students to choose to use those carols. In some classrooms, there were time where you use the carols, it was individual time, and then they would come out, come down and the, the, uh, the space would then become a group work area. And so you could see these clips right here, making it very easy to put the, car the work carols on and off of the desk. Other teachers allowed students to decorate the carols. They also right up here at the clip, they would put the, the top, top surface, they would clip an envelope and allow and, and use it as a reward system. So they'd walk around the class and put you know, fake money in there or you know, whatever the incentive is for the student, whatever the incentive is that they're working on. It's visual, it's a visual cue, it's in their work carol. Sometimes the students called them their desk. Like, I want my own workspace, I, I'm, I want my own uh, office, sorry. They, they called it their office. When they had the work carol up, they were in their office and they didn't want to be disturbed. So I thought that was pretty cute and effective. All right, so an easy question. Uh, I'm hoping that um, I was able to provide you with some new information today that you feel confident you can go back and share with your other, your, your coworkers, or perhaps share um, with parents and also share with the students you work with, you know, try to implement some of these new strategies. I want to share with you that this spring, starting January 7th, we have a, class, a new class at the University of North Florida. It's an online class called Deafness and Diversity. I'll be teaching that course and we will go through each, um, we will go through federal and state law, we'll talk about IEPs, we'll go about We'll go. Um, we'll talk about each disability area, and then we will also talk about students who are deaf multilingual learners. And so this slide is not included in the PDF, but I know RMTC is going to send out an announcement, and it allows you to link easily to how would you sign up and enroll in that class. Thank you so much, Caroline, for presenting today. I think this was some really great information. Um, I'd also like to thank our CART provider, Brooke Nunn, for from Alternative Communication Services for providing our captions today to help us always make sure we're accessible. Again, this webinar was recorded and we will be posting it on our website, which I provided in the um, chat box. If you could take a few minutes before you leave today to complete our survey, it's also in the chat box that helps us to continue offering these great webinars. The TA Live, um, if you need a certificate, you can also go over to RMTC thh.org backslash ta dash live and um, you can apply for a certificate for participation. So I know we are right there at the end. If didn't know if anybody had any questions they wanted to type in the chat box below, we give you guys a little bit of an opportunity to complete our survey. Thank you very much for having me today. That was it for today. We thank you for your attendance and we really hope to see you again next month. Um, we will be having described caption media come to talk to us about accessible media that you can get for free. Um, and you can use a computer, an iPad or any other digital way to access this media. And it's free for anyone who has at least one student who's deaf or hard of hearing or a visual impairment or is deaf blind. Um, and it's free for parents, students, general ed teachers, and special ed teachers. So that will be next month with Described Caption Media. Thank Again, you.
thank you very much for coming to our TA Live and thanks Caroline for presenting. You're welcome. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. And I'll give you guys just one more minute, see if you want to get anything out of that chat box. Again, we have our survey link there. We have the RMTC TA Live, where you can go and see our past webinars. And also I had a link to actual PDF, and I can post that one more time if you need a copy of the PowerPoint.